and thank you for joining us for another edition of Virginia Arts Waiting in the Wings. As I'm sure you know by now, these are challenging times for all of us as we try to cope with a pandemic that shows no signs of easing. Meanwhile, industries, businesses, and organizations are trying to keep their doors open and not only survive, but remain relevant. Fine arts performance venues, both for-profit and non-profit, are no exception. And we wanted to check in with a few folks to see how they are not only coping, but doing quite well. Joining me for a chat is Wendy Delano, Director of Facilities for the Salem Civic Center, Jeffrey Kirshner, Executive Director of the Academy Center of the Arts in Lynchburg, Susan Martin, Executive Director of the Bower Center for the Arts in Bedford, Cyrus Pace, Executive Director of the Jefferson Center right here in Roanoke, Justin Ryder, Executive Director of the Historic Masonic Theater in Clifton Forge, Robin Sean, General Manager of the Berglund Center and Performing Arts Theater, and Ruth Walks, Executive Director of the Moss Arts Center at Virginia Tech. Welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being here. We have lots to talk about, but I want to start really quick with Wendy and Robin. Let's start with you because you two probably oversee the, the largest, or you do oversee the largest facilities in the region. How did things change for you back in the spring? Wendy, let's go with you. Well, you know, when COVID-19 hit, we just basically shut the doors, quite frankly. Um, it was very difficult. We had a full schedule of events and performances on the calendar, and then everything came to a stop. And then we had to figure out, how do we move forward from this? Um, none of us have ever been in anything like what COVID-19 has experienced and and become, and it's gone longer than what any of us, I think, even anticipated in the beginning. Um, so it was a little bit chaotic to say the least, but we've come up with different ways to make ourselves relevant. Um, one of which is drive-in uh, concerts. We've had several of those um, over the summer and it's been very successful and we've been happy to at least provide a little bit of music to the community. Okay, and uh, what about you, Robin? I know you've been busy, lots going on with you. Yeah, you know, um, because we are a multi-use facility and we have a, a coliseum and a special event center as well as our theater, um, we didn't know what to make of COVID-19. I mean, at first we just tapped the brakes because we thought, okay, how long is this going to be here? And then we realized quickly when Broadway, the Broadway, closed down and the Hockey League uh, canceled games, this was bigger than what we thought we were getting into. Uh, we have not exactly been without business, but we've had to manage our business so strictly that it's prohibitive to have live entertainment and sports in our any of our venues, um, you know, out of following the governor's executive orders, but also, and more importantly, people's safety and, and health. It's just, it's economically speaking, it does not make sense at all to try and do anything and, and a facility like a Wendy's and mine and probably Cyrus, well, actually everybody on the screen, um, facilities like ours to try and do anything because a thousand people is not going to, you know, pay the light bill. Um, and of course, all the tours stopped. And uh, when Broadway extended their closure to June, now we don't know what that's going to look like for, for performing arts uh, in venues like ours through 2022. We're hopeful. We're trying to stay positive. We did put some uh, virtual concerts out there, which were free um, to stay relevant. As Wendy said, you know, you want to keep your name out there and uh, let people know that we have a pulse. Well, let's go to some of the smaller venues. Uh, I guess let's start with you, Jeffrey, uh, with the uh, Academy. How did how did you sort of pivot with everything? Well, we're a multidiscipline arts center. And so we, you know, we have a bunch of different facets to the organization. There's two theaters, but we also have galleries and a wide range of education programming, uh, as well as a, a wide range of community partners. Uh, some of them in the performing arts sector, you know, we, we have five resident companies uh, with us. So for us, we, we really quickly decided that we need to become a, a digital content company. Uh, and most everything started moving through our marketing department. And because we have an education history, uh, a lot of it moved through education. So we were figuring out how to connect people digitally right now uh, to the arts uh, in ways that were safe. And that was really kind of the first chapter. Um, you know, education programs have been able to move on site with uh, coordination with the health department. And uh, we've had, you know, we've had student performances with, you know, all kinds of regulations in place. But 
Uh, in regards to bringing the public through in a high sort of volume ticketed events, that's probably the most difficult. So for us, it's about what else do we have? Our galleries are back open again, uh, responding to BLM through the galleries, making sure that we're uh, connecting with audiences. We're also finding new audiences right digitally. Um, we have like, we have Zoom um, paint and sip classes that we're teaching to people in California and Michigan. Um, and so, uh, so that I, it's an interesting moment. We have some things that uh, we probably will keep after this moment. Um, mm. Uh, once when we kind of come back to whatever the new normal is. Because I realize there's been, a, you, you've kind of learned a few things and sort of come across new things that you never thought you'd even think about trying that you've all of a sudden had to try. So I'm sure that's made a difference. Susan, I wanted to talk to you because you're in Bedford. And mm -hmm. so you already have sort of a small organization, a small facility in a kind of a small town. How have you handled all of this? So much like the Academy, while we're smaller as far as the audiences we serve, we are a visual and performing arts um, organization. Um, we too had to shut down for a period of time and then it took us a while to redevelop health and safety guidelines to be able to reopen some of our programs and services. Um, we do have two galleries and provide rotating exhibits and we do performances, live concerts, um, and then we have a huge educational programming department as well. So we too had to look at virtual options. One of the things that impacted us greatly, of course, was being closed during the summer. And we typically have summer camps for eight to 10 weeks straight uh, throughout the summer. So we had to um, turn those into virtual opportunities. Um, and we have started with some of the um, paint nights and offering a lot of options that um, are virtual, which has been positive for us because we too have seen individuals participating from outside of the immediate area and outside of the state. Um, friends and family members of local individuals are joining on to these paint nights and opportunities to get together with family and friends um, through a fun activity. So that's been a positive change to us as well. Well, I want a movement now to, I guess, maybe sort of medium size. Cyrus, uh, you're at the Jefferson Center, you and, uh, and Ruth and um, Justin, sort of medium size uh, facilities. Let's start with you, Cyrus. How have you adapted? Sure. So um, as others have said, it really is an issue of earned revenue, right? The things we do that sell tickets and uh, get us uh, the guests that we want to see and the patrons that we build relationships with, that, of course, went away. Uh, we're be we benefit from the fact that we also have multiple revenue streams, including 20 nonprofit tenants who lease space from us. So that's helpful in terms of cash flow. Uh, but in the performing arts environment, there's just really little. So we're depending on the um, the, uh, the benevolence of our community, who of course wants to see our, all of these cultural assets uh, still here in a year and a year and a half or however long it takes. Uh, we adapted our education program to be all online. And then we just put out a virtual series that actually uh, went on sale Tuesday of this week. Uh, six concerts that we recorded on our stages and it's $10 a concert. So Robin, I'm, I'm hoping we haven't stretched the market in terms of ticket price, but $54 uh, for six tickets. And uh, we're, we're hopeful that that's a way to, again, keep our relevance, but also, um, you know, give people the music they've been sort of hungry for. And Justin, you are in Clifton Forge. You kind of have a little bit of what's going on with the Bauer Center. You're a small community, but you do quite a big, quite a, quite a few performances. How about you? We do. Um, and, you know, we're fortunate that we have an amphitheater. So we were able to show movies all summer and it was a pay what you will. Uh, plus we had concessions revenue. Uh, we also have a tenant in the building. So we've got a little bit of rent that comes from that. But, you know, this theater was completely renovated four years ago and the support that's come from the community and the surrounding community during this time has been absolutely incredible. Um, they, they want us to come back. Um, we are doing a few things within the theater. We had an election forum for city council the other night with about 40 people. We have a 70 capacity on the orchestra and about another 50 more in the balcony. And we're going to start showing movies on Sundays in November, uh, family movies at 3 p.m. So we'll have some more concessions revenue coming in from that and, and pay what you will. So um, safe start, kind of basically what everybody's trying to do. Understood. And Ruth, uh, kind of a little bit different for you because you kind of have a built-in audience with the Virginia Tech yeah. students. When they disappeared, I would imagine your audience disappeared, not to mention the, the performers, the acts, and so on and so forth. But uh, how are you? 
dealing? Uh, well, as with everyone else, it was mid-March when we had to close close our doors, and we are up, you know full part of the university. So we were fortunate we had the the support and the guidance of everything that comes through the university systems. But yeah, that that for us represented about almost a third of our season at that point that we had to cancel, and then we had to cancel summer events. Uh, but our staff were amazing. Um, they really shifted very very quickly. What can we do in the real short term to keep a presence to have? Uh, activity online. We did a, a student um, art show that was all online, invited students to submit work electronically. We had some really wonderful footage from past performances. So we, we had our virtual or, you know, from the vault kind of performances that we were able to run through the summer. And at the same time, our, our programming staff were began curating an all online series for the fall. So our virtual home stage series kicked off end of August. And we've had, a, you know, as others have said, I mean, it's amazing the community support, how our patrons still want to continue. They want to take part. Um, we, you know, did charge for that series. Um, and we've had, we've had audiences literally from around the world. We've got artists from around the world. And I think another interesting thing is the conversations with artists to develop those programs. They're very intimate and personal. And while we'd love to have, you know, 1,200 people in our theater to see an artist, there is something really quite special when you're, you know, at someone's home and she's in Barcelona playing the piano and turns around and talks to you and answers questions. So I, I think the other piece of that for, for us with all of our, uh, our fall series now, those are free for Virginia Tech students. And um, students have been honestly like 30 to 50% of our audience. They're really taking advantage of that. Um, and with those artists, we've been able to, as others have said, you know, the educational aspects to offer engagement with the students directly with the artists. And those have been particularly meaningful for our students this, this time because, you know, they're they're doing something very unusual. They're working in isolation and it's not normal and they need those outlets and those conversations. So the, those silver linings others have mentioned, we're seeing as well, although everyone's hungry to be back in the theater and in the building. Right. Right, right, right. And I would imagine for some of you, maybe uh, Robin, you know, some of the bigger, uh, I guess I'm curious also, you, you probably seem to have the largest staff that you maybe had to deal with, whether it was furloughs, layoffs, and things like that. Um, how, how did that, I mean, that, that had to have been rough, and was it rough, and sort of what happened there as far as the, the employees go? Well, that's probably one of the saddest stories that we have to tell because, um, you know, when you think about what it takes to put on a show, we have uh, over 125 part-time people on our payroll and all of them were furloughed for probably three months until we started creeping back in. We have a full-time staff of 28 people um, and 14 of those have been furloughed. And, you know, it's our hope that we are going to be bringing them back. Um, I don't know win, but they, they have a passion for this business. So it's more, it's more than the paycheck for so many people. And they're dealing with these emotional issues that follow not being able to do what they love for a living. So we've got empty halls and empty offices and, um, you know, empty stages and it's, it's heartbreaking. It truly is. You know, you think about it in entertainment, live entertainment itself, over 95,000 people are unemployed right now. Many of them are layoffs, not furloughs. And you think about, and we'll go back to the theater, just Broadway alone. Uh, we're looking at, I mean, the Broadway in New York City, $500 million loss, but overall the economic impact in New York City is 500 billion with a B. And that absolutely trickles down into markets our size. So, um, so many people are, struggling right now and it's it's sad and the arts of course first to shut down will be the last to open and that that chasm in between is now being filled with what we the content that we like right right yeah it's almost i'm just wondering i mean between the larger venues and the smaller venues i'm trying to figure out you know not that anyone's better off but you know when you have such a large staff i mean wendy <laughs> probably the same story for you to a degree, um, our staff's slightly smaller than Robbins. Um, at our facility, you know, we've got the arena, but we also have the community room and, and several parlors. And then we have tenants on staff um, or on site, such as the Red Sox. And then we've got the football stadium. Um, so, you know, people aren't playing football right now. Um, it's a totally different world, but that'll come later. 
Um, Red Sox have managed to keep themselves relevant, which is good. Our staff, we've we've been fortunate where we've been able, because we've got about 20 on staff, um, our part-timers, just like Robin's at, at the other facility, has had to go to the wayside right now. Um, we don't have events, so we can't afford to keep the part-timers working. And it's sad because they're like family. They're the lifeblood of what makes our events happen when we're open and operating as normal. Um, our full-time staff, we found other ways for them to be relevant. For instance, some of our guys that would normally be setting up concerts and shows on the floors are now helping actually in either our street department, helping with mowing during the seasons as needed for the city, um, right. or they might be back in our catering department dealing with catering functions. So we're wearing a lot of hats and we're willing to step into a lot of different roles just to stay on the paycheck. Um, and it's not what they were hired to do. It's not what any of them have the passion to do, but it's what we're doing to survive at this point in time. Now with some of the smaller or medium to smaller venues, Cyrus and, and, and the rest of you, uh, you probably have a better ability because I know a lot of you and a lot of arts in general have gone online. So if you're able to get one artist to do a performance or a trio here or something there, uh, it seems like it's more doable for the medium to smaller organizations. Are you relying on that sort of technology and online to kind of keep you going? Cyrus, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, unfortunately the metrics are kind of the same, whether the performer is in person or not. Oftentimes we're finding there you the artists aren't mechanized to do it. Like we all kind of thought that they might be at this point. Or they're unfortunately looking for the same sort of um, fee ranges that they would have if they were in my venue making that earned revenue, right? So what we did for our virtual series is we're presenting stuff that's drivable. The best art we could find within three states is what we're saying. Um, and, you know, recording it in our hall, which kind of personalizes it, we hope. And then, of course, it's, you know, original content that we can then sell. Um, but the metrics are hard for everybody in every aspect of what we do right now. So, you know, socially distant shows, you're not going to be able to pencil that out and make sense of it. Um, you know, so it's about the organizations who are going to figure out a way, I guess, to be okay with a third or less than that of earned revenue and ticket sale revenue over the next year or year and a half. Ruth, what about you? Because I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine that uh, uh, maybe quite a few folks on your crew, your staff, maybe they're student workers and they sort of disappeared. I mean, are you still able to do uh, sort of online and use technology? Oh, very much so. In fact, our, our core staff, core professional staff is, is all intact. We have uh, you know, 30 some people. Um, our production staff has, I mean, have been vital because we are in effect producing these online programs. The artists are streaming from wherever they are in the world. But in some cases, um, it's been our staff, we've been able to get equipment to them um, to help them with the production values, doing rehearsals, all of that. So that's actually been a real boon for our production staff. And we also are supporting things on site for the university, our School of Performing Arts. We've had faculty and students who've been coming in to do streamed events, um, to do, you know, distanced and very, very safely accomplished, um, you know, rehearsals and things like that. So there's a lot of activity from the university as well that we're able to support in our venue. Our building is open now and, and um, we do have our galleries open. So that's helpful. Um, yeah, I think for, in terms of staffing, the hardest hit are just our, our wage staff who, of of course, without the events and sort of the regular hours, we're not able to give them nearly as many hours. Um, but yeah, our staff and I think the um, the 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 benefit of the pressure maybe on our marketing and our social media folks has really ramped up too. So in some ways, well, we're all working mostly remotely. I feel like we're pedaling really fast, and there's an awful lot going on uh, to keep people engaged. And we're fortunate that we've been able to do that. What about, uh, let's, let's go to Justin with this one. What, what maybe, what's the big lesson? What have you sort of learned from all of this? Again, being in a small community, Clifton Forge, I mean, not a very big town at all. Uh, what, what have sort of has been your lesson maybe that you've learned from all of this? Uh, your mic oh, is I'm muted. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, I mean, I'm taking it day by day. I, I think I find that I'm busier than ever. Um, and, and that's sort of, you know, when I sit down in the evening, it's kind of shocking about how busy I am trying to figure out what we're learning from this, but also keep all these balls in the air. 
Um, but we took, we were taking advantage of the, our production department getting additional training. Um, we've even reached out to Dale, who's the sound design teacher at Virginia Tech. He might come up and do some training with our audio folks and our lighting folks too. So, you know, we're going down deep. We're going into the bylaws and all kinds of stuff. I mean, you know, there's, we're just trying, we, we're taking this moment as a reset so that when we are able to come back with full capacity that, that we're prepared. In the meantime, we're going to do the virtual thing and book the heck out of the amphitheater next summer. Okay. That sounds, yeah, I gotcha. Susan, what about you? Uh, any, any sort of lessons learned? Anything that maybe had sort of came up that you weren't expecting that you're thinking, oh, hey, we'll keep doing this? Um, well, I think just in general, obviously we weren't prepared for something like a pandemic. So this has really, you know, put it put us immediately into um, emergency action and developing some policies and protocols that we're going to carry forward because we just weren't prepared for something like that. Um, you know, we also, again, um, looked at new alternatives or ways to um, present our programming um, and have expanded our virtual opportunities and um, we too are doing additional training and um, some grants to purchase some additional equipment that going forward, hopefully we'll be able to continue to offer um, more of our programs virtually. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have reopened to the public with uh, a little bit of a limited hours um, just because we want to be able to clean uh, more regularly. And, um, you know, we've been real fortunate. Our exhibits have been very well received and we did start doing those both in person and virtual as well. So all of our exhibits are available to view online. Um, and we've just tried to recreate some of our programming too, to um, encourage folks to take advantage of the online option if they don't feel comfortable coming out in person yet, but also ensuring them that we're following all of our health and safety guidelines to make sure that we're providing them with a space um, that's safe to come and, and enjoy the arts. And Jeffrey, uh, you know, like you said, you have a facility where you kind of do the visual arts and, you know, kind of, I guess, two, two phases, I guess, if you will. Uh, what are you doing or what have you learned that will maybe help propel you forward? Yeah, I, you know, one of the interesting things for us is in many ways, we're a new organization. Um, we're, we've been in existence for a long time, but we, uh, uh, just like in Clifton Forge, our, our historic theater just opened in December of 18. And so our organization uh, tripled in size in the last five years. And so we're actually a pretty large organization. We had 20 full-time members when this, when this happened. So uh, full-time staff members. So uh, so for us, we, we haven't known stasis. Like we don't know... You know, we, we, we were in the middle of, of just executing a strategic model we had just built. So a lot of this for our team right now, who is, who is pretty young and pretty adept at, at sort of shifting gears and figuring out how we adapt to the moment. So we're doing a lot of, of sort of examining how we operate. We're becoming a flatter organization. So we're having to really trust uh, team members to lead uh, and innovate and sort of figure out ways to plug in right now. And so for us, this is an opportunity. It's not fun and we don't want to be doing it, but we do see an opportunity to grow right now. And we just have a few minutes left, but I'll start with you. What can people do to sort of help you in this process? Obviously fundraising and that kind of thing, but what, what can we all do to sort of help organizations like yours continue? I, I think stay aware of, stay plugged in. I, I think for everybody on this interview today, that's what's most important. You know, our, our main means of connection, connecting with the public is bringing lots of people together to share space and time and energy. And when we don't have that, you know, it is really difficult. I mean, we're, we're talking about finding new ways and I think that's positive and will go with us moving forward. But, uh, but we need people to, to keep, keep tabs on us. This is probably gonna be longer than any of us want it to be. And we're going to want these facilities, these venues, these organizations when this is done. Uh, and so, so please stay with us and support us as we move through it. Susan, how about you? And what do you have coming up? Um, I agree. Just staying with us, communicating, signing up for our newsletters, um, becoming involved. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, coming up, we've got two new exhibits that are currently live, and we're actually um, going to have our first in-person concert on November 7th. And so we're, you know, anxious to see how that's going to look, to see what the response is going to be in our community for folks that are ready to come out um, for a gathering. Obviously, we've, we're limiting and social distancing, so it's a much smaller audience, but um, we had this on our concert series schedule, and it's actually our last concert of the series, and we didn't get to host any of our other concerts in the series, so we really wanted to 
try to end the year on a high note and, and, and bring live music back to the Bauer Center. Great. Very quickly, Cyrus. Yeah, so I uh, support our virtual series, which we're calling Listen Now and Gather Later. And um, if you're not getting our solicitations, that means I'm not doing my job. So <laughs> make sure you're getting those and are um, you know, on their email list and uh, consider writing a check in addition to um, you know, caring about the concerts we're doing, basically. Absolutely. Justin, real quick. Mike is off again. You can we've, got, we've got movies on Sundays uh, in November, and then we're going to do some virtual concerts in December, including an Allegheny Highlands Christmas with Virginia Opry and a couple of uh, bands doing that. So we're, we're very excited about that. Um, and I think just our community loves this building. They know that we're here for the community, and that is our main purpose. It's a community gathering place, and we're very going to be very excited when we can do that again. Then Robin um, and and Wendy, I know it's a little bit different because you guys are are bigger facilities and people can only sort of help you if you have events for them to come to. Very quickly, what do you have coming up? The uh, only thing I can say encouraging, um, looking forward is for people to support the arts in our community, no matter what that art looks like. If you have tickets out there, it's helpful if you don't ask for a refund, but rather roll those over. Give us an opportunity to present at some point. That would that would help people tremendously, I think. And, um, you know, support the people who work here. We've got over 100 doors. I'm, I'm anxious to open every single one of them to let a half million people in next year. So just Wendy, keep on. very quickly. Sure. Yeah. Um, from our end, you know, I just encourage people to go out to our social media and follow us on our website. Um, we'll have all of our upcoming events out there. Some of the things that we've got for holidays coming up is we've got a, a Christmas parade in our back parking lot, which will be a lot of fun. And we've got an indoor craft market that'll be taking place as well. And it'll keep everyone safe. So we look forward to seeing everyone as soon as we can get everyone back in. Well, it sounds like you're just going to try to keep things going, all of you, the best way that you know how. And uh, we look forward to keeping up with you and uh, and following all your, your events coming up. Thank you all, all of you, for joining us for this very special uh, episode. And we will see all of you hopefully very soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.